hello good evening i think we'll wait for just you know two three minutes to for people to join in Two more minutes to go. Hello, Sujit sir. Hi, I'm Dutta Tai. So people are trickling in. I think we'll start in about a minute now. <coughs> so yeah, I think we'll start and hoping that people will join and more numbers as in when we progress with the program. So, uh, good evening, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, my name is Shweta and I am from Parisar. Um, so, this is our first Parisar uh, Insta Live interview and we are very, very excited to do this. Uh, so, let's just get this started without any much further ado. So, the issue that we are going to uh, be tackling in today's interview and talking more about is something that affects everyone, everyone. Uh, because it's about the air that you're breathing, the air that you are breathing, I'm breathing every second of our lives, even as you're watching me live, even as you're doing any of your other things. So it's, there's no one who's not affected by it. So um, I think one of the questions that I really thought about was that, do we ever stop and think that, you know, uh, we are breathing, but is the air that we are breathing clean? And forget about clean, do we even know that the air that we are breathing can really be toxic? I mean, it can be taking away precious years from our lives, making, the, making our bodies sick. And um, I mean, this is just very counterintuitive. I mean, you're reducing your life just by drawing breath. But this is true, unfortunately. And our guest today uh, really knows much more about this uh, grave issue and this uh, whole uh, counterintuitive calculation that exists. Uh, in much more detail than any of us would be comfortable knowing. So what really, really propelled us, encouraged us to schedule this interview with her was the publication of a recent book, which in fact uh, documents uh, air quality and air pollution in a variety of uh, uh, layers in many perspectives through various perspectives that exist towards this issue. And uh, I mean, Parisar has been working on air quality management and air pollution mitigation in Pune for more than a decade. But uh, in, in this whole process, if there's one thing that we've realized, it is that um, awareness or the fact that people don't know anything or much about the air that they are breathing and the impact that it has on their bodies is probably the major roadblock in uh, this fight for clean air. So um, I mean, what really made us do this is that more, we want more people to know about this book, we want more people to know about this issue and hence let me just without any further delay get to the issue itself. So the book that I'm talking about is called Breathing Here is Injurious to Your Health and the guest is the writer of this book uh, Jyoti Pandey Lavakare. Let me just uh, add her to this um, video. Let's see if she's... Yes, so Jyoti is here. Hi, Jyoti. And it's really, really nice to be finally seeing you and meeting you. And thank you for making the time for this. Absolutely. I will just... <laughs> yeah. I think I'll just quickly introduce you and let's just get on with our range of questions because, you know, we are really excited to get this started. So Jyoti is an independent financial journalist, author, and a clean air evangelist. She started as a radio journalist in 1985 while still in college. 
uh, and began her professional career as a reporter with the Economic Times in 1990, moving to Dow Jones News Wires in 1995. She switched to writing freelance columns for national and international newspapers after relocating to California in 2006. After moving back to India, she wrote regular columns on startups and entrepreneurship for the Business Standard and India Inc. and currently writes extensively on air pollution. She co-founded Care for Air in 2015, which works in bringing awareness of the health harms of air pollution and advocating clean air for all. She also writes fiction and creative nonfiction, and her first book, a personalized nonfiction narrative on the human cost of air pollution called Breathing Here is Injurious to Your Health, was published by Hatchet in November 2020. So with this, I think it brings me to the very first question, Jyoti. Uh, so me and my colleague uh, Sharmila read your book very closely. We enjoyed it. We were uh, surprised by it. We were hit by it. And that's why we want more people to know about what this book is about. So I remember telling Sharmila that when I read the initial pages of your book in which you describe your mother in so much nuance and so much detail that, you know, the way she used to uh, uh, treasure her riyas, the way she used to drape her saris, the way she used to, um, you know, uh, small, small things that really remind you of people more than the larger things. And I said to Sharmila that, you know, I wish she'd put a photograph of her mother in the book because I feel like seeing her. And I actually went on the internet and I uh, went up and saw the photo, but it was a much recent one. But basically the point here I'm making is by writing about this very personal tragedy of yours, uh, of your mother's illness caused by air pollution, you've really humanized an environmental issue, which otherwise we speak of in statistics and, you know, numbers and facts, which is very dry. So my question to you is, uh, you know, you've been concerned with air quality ever since you moved to India from US, uh, but more so after your mother's condition. What, at what point did you think about writing a book about it? What made you write this book? So firstly, I wanted to thank Parisad and thank you and Pramila for the book, because it is meant to be for people to really understand how serious the problem is. And I Really, thank you very much. It's not an easy book to read. It's it's a lot of uh, you know information that we don't really want to know. And I myself yeah. went trial. So first, I really wanted to thank you guys. Secondly, in the book, there is actually a, a photograph, an illustrated drawing of a oh. young. Oh, my version doesn't have it. Seems like, but yeah, it's great to see that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is how she was as a young woman who was learning. Um, she was an MA, uh, Masters in Hindi and also in classical music. That was her passion. So uh, I think to answer your question, um, I have always been concerned in, in a very normal sort of way, like most of us should be, I think, not as a, a you know, not somebody who went into it for a career or environmentalist but just to be mindful because I feel very strongly that we have just one earth and uh, we need to take care of it. It takes care of us. We need to take care of it. When I was growing up, you know, as a young person, I don't think you really think of your own mortality. You think you're immortal. And uh, yeah. I see that in my children now. You don't worry about things. It's when I became a mother and uh, I think when you have two young um, people completely dependent on you two people. Um, and I had moved back from the US. So I was born and raised in Delhi. And it wasn't as if uh, I didn't notice that the air quality was bad. In fact, I think I have it in the book somewhere. Uh, at the ITO crossing, there was a big sign. I always talk about how India and how Delhi was uh, so polluted. Uh, so I was aware of that, but in a very peripheral way. It's when these two little kids uh, would have me and I, my husband and I chose to come back to our It was a very active choice we made. So that guilt, you know, suddenly when I started feeling something is wrong in the air and, you know, I brought these children in here where they we didn't really need to come back. Um, so that it started a little bit with that guilt. It started with confusion. My friends who I grew up with here, went to college with and school with, Tell me, oh, there's no problem. What do you talk about? You've lived in the West. So you've been And my expat friends, and I had a lot of expat friends, um, 
was saying, are you crazy? Why did you come back with these two little things? And, you know, you took your own lungs by uh, being here. Now you're doing that to your children. And that really worried me. And being a financial, being a journalist, I think the only way that I find any kind of, uh, you know, the only way to figure it out was to research it for myself. And so thank mm-hmm. the internet and, and thanks to a lot of tools that we have, I sort of dived uh, into it and realized very quickly to my horror that it was not just that air quality and, and air pollution was terrible here, a Western secret, but that all that information was available on the web for anybody to see. Mm-hmm. So it's actually a thick <coughs> site. And that was to me a horrific so some friends of mine and I, they're all professionals. So one of them was a lawyer, another journalist, public health researchers, um, some expats in the beginning. We just got together and we thought, well, instead of sitting and complaining about it all the time, let's try and do something constructive and productive. And so mm-hmm. one we thought, like, we had been unaware and we are not experts. Let's try and make the science behind it. Let's simplify it and amplify it and make other people aware so that when more and more people become aware, then maybe they will start asking for change. So that's how that journey started. But then, like, I think for writing the book, it was when I saw my mother suffering through the last few months of her life. And, you know, knowing everything in my head was very different from feeling in my heart when I would see her um, and when I would imagine the agony she was going through, because like people say, there is palliative uh, care for lung cancer. You know, for mm-hmm. other cancer, you can give morphine, you can give painkillers, but there's palliative care Nothing for lungs. Breathe. <clears throat> that was scary for me. And I think after she passed away and, and I went through my own grief and processed it, that's when I thought, you know, I think... The only thing that I could do to make meaning of her life and to make meaning of her death and to help others not, you know, to become more aware was to document all this in the form of a book, try and keep it simple, uh, try not to get pulled into the details of the science, but make sure that the science was there for people to go to. So I think within, I would say she passed away in January of, uh, of 2018. Um, I think uh, by about April or May, I had started thinking about, uh, you know, how to document this. <clears throat> by the end of the year, I had a structure and I had uh, decided how I want to write it. I wanted to personalize it because there are enough really good books on this issue, uh, which are very scientific. And unfortunately, that tends to be mm-hmm. dry. So I wanted to make this something which would humanize it. So that's how it happened. And I think you've been absolutely successful in doing what you set out for. I mean, it was really emotional and, you know, um, it was the entire package. Yeah. So my second question, uh, then, I mean, I'm going in the sequence of, you know, how I read the book. So uh, you've uh, mentioned in the earlier pages of the book and also in the earlier struggle where you just started entering into the air quality um, uh, scenario that you observed a certain despondency among the medical fraternity to actually come out and be very vocal about, you know, how hazardous air pollution really is. But you've also mentioned that over time, there were really renowned uh, medical professionals who came out and supported you in your fight for cleaner air. So uh, can you just take us through this journey and generally just highlight the role that the medical fraternity has in this fight for clean air? So I think in the early days, as I was getting to know more and more about air pollution, I did notice that uh, when I talked to um, some of the doctors that I was talking to, and I'm not just talking about uh, uh, my mother's uh, doctors, I'm talking about generally when I would meet doctors, they were, some of them were very aware, but they mm. said, what can we do? What can you do? You know, and for a doctor, mm-hmm. yeah, to uh, say that. In, in India, especially, I can say, mm-hmm. you know, treat yourself when you go to any doctor's clinic. There are thousands of patients. Doctors are, uh, there aren't as many doctors, many patients that we have. And doctors literally, especially if you go to our public health, and we have some of the best doctors at Ames and all the public hospitals. Yeah. Find, you know, thousands of patients and there's just one doctor. So yeah. that 
you know, they literally have to make split second life altering decisions in 30 seconds, a minute. And I don't think they have the time to really, uh, you know, explain to each person that, you know, this disease that you have could yes. be an environmental factor. And some doctors, unfortunately, are also, I found enough doctors who were completely unaware, you know, so there'd be a super specialist of, let's say, liver, who would not mm -hmm. know because they are so sort of focused on their specialty. Right. They don't right. think of the bigger picture. So there was a combination of that. And I think uh, it was uh, both were, were hard to uh, come to terms with because on one hand, I felt that the doctors who knew about it owed it mm -hmm. to their tell them. But I could see that because of the limited time that they have and the hurry with which they, uh, you know, treat a lot of patients sometimes, it's not possible. It's more of public health. And some of them may... We are just doctors and clinicians, one at a time, how many people do you tell, right? I mean, it should be the right. job, health researchers, the government, etc. But the ones who didn't know were shocked and surprised and they would question. And because they are doctors, they then say, no, 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 it doesn't make that much of a difference. So I yeah. think the time the, those two things sort of came together, I think what happened was for the doctors who were aware, they were unable to, at a certain point, they were unable to turn their head away from this, especially when mm -hmm. the internet and photography and uh, the the uh, the progress we have made in science has a lot to do with it. Because when doctors were able to show us pictures of lungs that were blackened, yeah, yeah. I think that was the first time that you know you weren't just being told. It's always very mm -hmm. fun to be shown rather Absolutely. than you know a doctor telling you a day stop smoking. You know this is what you. Mm -hmm. Versus yeah. a, doctor, a photograph of lungs that have gone through, yeah. you know, smoker's lungs versus the non-smoker's lungs. That makes a lot of difference. So I think people yes. were beginning to listen to that and doctors were beginning to feel okay by just showing, sharing a photograph or by just quickly, you know, getting onto a, a conventional or social media and saying this, I can make a difference. They felt more empowered. And then when people start feeling empowered, that's when change comes. Change this is what happened. And then the medical fraternity, I think more and more, there's um, uh, one of the doctors, uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar, has started this Doctors for Clean Air, where all the doctors from different uh, um, uh, you know, uh, specialties have come together and they talk about this and they're going from city to city. And I think those are exactly the kind of initiatives that we need because, you know, right. We will all listen to our doctors in, 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 in India, especially doctors, yes. <laughs> especially in smaller towns. When the doctor sahab tells you something, that's the mm -hmm. word, the law. So that's absolutely, how. absolutely. Uh, so I've, I'm just making an announcement for the viewers. If at any point you have any questions, please, those, uh, please leave them in the comment section and we'll get back to it in the last 15 minutes of the session. I forgot to say this in the beginning. So yeah, so my third question really is that, I mean, when I was reading the book, one of the things that really struck me, it, it was like the repeated episodes of, you know, people coming to Delhi, then falling sick, and then taking out the time to figure out that, oh my God, it's the air that's making you sick. It's not a virus. You can't take a medicine on it and get over it. It's the air. And just the repeated episodes of people actually living a city because the air is making them sick. I think it was very sure I have goosebumps right now even speaking about that because sitting here in Pune, I can't imagine, you know, taking all my stuff and just going somewhere because the air is making me sick. But this is really happening. And I really want people to know that, you know, uh, this is happening. Pollution migration is a reality. And I want you to shed some more light on uh, what all you have actually documented in the book regarding this exodus that is happening in Delhi already. Absolutely. So uh, what I noticed was first I started noticing this with, uh, again, with my fat friends, because what happens is with people who have other homes and other choices, it's easier to make that choice. Once you realize it's one of those things, once you know the damage it's causing, it's very hard to unknow it. You know, you can never, mm. now that I know it, I'll just ignore it. You can't do that. It's very, no, no, absolutely not. An option to move to a place with cleaner air, you'll take it. And so I started noticing mm -hmm. from my friends who were <clears throat> giving the reason every time, because most of them loved India. They wanted to stay here longer, but yeah. they 
and some of them had young children so those people felt more compelled to leave the city because they knew that this was not just something that was a temporary uh, problem and it was going to have a irreversible cumulative health effect on their children so i think noticing a pattern which i feel in i mean from my own anecdotal research and evidence i found that it kind of peaked around 2015 2000 16 when a whole bunch of people left at the same time and all of them were saying you know um yeah leaving because of bad air and one of the dentists i spoke to who actually had a lot of uh, clients from this fraternity also said that you know we i've been noticing a lot of people are moving and in fact schools are now you know the principals of schools are commenting on this so you know these kind of things made me and as a journalist you know you're very alert to pick up trends you pick up yes. patterns very quickly so that made me realize that people are leaving and then i started noticing indian uh, you know there were a lot of in mm-hmm. fact my own care for air uh, co-founders abhishek bhartia the they run the sitaram bhartia group he relocated his family out to canada and he did not want to do it he did not do it because he wanted to move to canada very rooted that and he's very rooted in india but he was just very afraid and that's documented in the book as well that he yes, woke absolutely not being able to breathe and that's a yeah. scary thing and you can ask any asthma patient how it feels to not be able yes. to when he felt that and he thought that this is what i'm going to be putting my kids through they actually moved as well and i started noticing a trend and a pattern amongst uh, a lot of people from delhi who were moving if they could if they had the ability to move out of india right. then that but if they didn't they were at least moving out of delhi so uh, you know even um, uh, dr uh, sarath kutikunda uh, you know mm-hmm. the people who found out about it like i said it was mm-hmm. it's and so people moved to goa people were moving to smaller cities bang i saw noticing people telling me that Oh, um, like there was this. Um, I think it was Cushman and Wakefield. Somebody who I was talking to there, they said, you know, people are actually looking f- to move out of Delhi, and the reason they are giving us is we want to move to places with clean air. So now we have them to. And then I, when I was talking to people, uh, for example, make my trip uh, founder Deep uh, Kalra. He uh, also mentioned that you know they had done a research, a little study within their own company. there were people who were willing to take a cut in their salary to be able mm-hmm. to uh, to places Somewhere right so all these little 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 patterns were coming to and it was really scary because you're right i mean yeah. and the other thing i just want to point out to you um today pune has clean air today worry about it but it's mm-hmm. it's coming to all of us it's not just you Absolutely. know research in december uh, there was research that showed that goa and kerala and a lot of other uh, uh, places with cleaner air are catching up with delhi's uh, and delhi has a geographical misfortune as we all know yeah absolutely and, uh, you know so it's these other places which have the ability which are by the seaside or like bangalore you get you know either nature washes it away or blows it away even these places are now creating so much pollution that even nature is not able to help wash it or Sorry. blow it away so unfortunately i hate to say this but uh, you know pune which is not a city uh, i think that is also going to go that way where unless we don't move now unless you as a pune resident and others who can raise their voices and say look mm-hmm. don't want to breathe terrible air unless that is not done starting now this is going to be the fate for all of us because where do you run to when you're you know in your absolutely where do you run absolutely. to absolutely 90% of india is polluted it's way beyond the who limits. levels so even pune although you say that the aqi is much low it's still not yeah. within the levels of the who no. yeah in fact pune is a non attainment city so we can't we just don't have any excuse to give so um, another observation from the answer of this question itself is the fact that um, the the sort of inequality that air pollution really brings to the society as a whole where the um, i think largest brunt of air pollution is taken by those who are who have no resources 
so i i don't want to go get into the fact of you know who pollutes more or what but as you said i mean people who have have who do have the resources to move will move but what about the people who are poorer and who are more vulnerable who are uh, living on the streets i think it affects them the most so yeah i think this is something we want uh, everybody to know about uh, that air pollution is a social inequity it is it does affect uh, there was a recent uh, story done by the new york times which again i always see stories that show rather than tell it had uh, tracked two young children one from a privileged home who slept in a room which was uh, uh, which had an air purifier and then went to her yeah. pool in uh, in a car and then her uh, classrooms were full cool. yeah 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 her exposure to air pollution was much less than this other child who was from an underprivileged family whose school actually was under a flyover and he didn't yeah. make- all tenement and so they actually measured the personal exposure of both these children and it was very clear to anyone to see that you know the privilege so it is a social inequity and not just for children for everyone i mean if you just think auto rickshaw drivers traffic uh, construction workers who are working at construction yeah. sites they're the poorest of the poor and they by virtue they can't take a day off when air quality shoots up no. they don't Absolutely get not. work they don't get paid so they are mm. the ones who are the worst affected and i think that is something that our government needs to acknowledge first and then do something because very often you'll you'll hear oh air pollution is a is a elite problem it, right it's opposite it, the only problem is that people who are the most affected by it are unfortunately the least aware and aware. They, not able to ask for it those of us who know about it and who have a voice and who talk about it it then it starts appearing like this is a problem for of the elite of but it's elite a, a, absolute opposite yes true true absolutely um so i mean it's evident that you know we be, we need both advocacy and awareness to really rein in this monster of air pollution advocacy which will bring out change in the policy level at the top in the way governments function in the way governments take action and awareness as you said so that you know people know so that they can demand for cleaner air they can say they can uh, rise up against you know this health hazard that it is causing so we need both and we we are aware of it but uh, i mean as an ngo working for so many years we also do know that uh, civil society organizations often do not have the resources to do it all so in that case what would you give more weightage to advocacy or awareness or there is no one or the other <laughs> i don't think there's one or the other but i would say that even advocacy begins mm-hmm. everything begins with awareness because if you don't right. know, you know what the problem is what is causing it what are the contributors to air pollution how what will you advocate for so to mm-hmm. me it begins with awareness and that's why i mean i could not think of any other way to help because you know it's such a it's such a huge problem as right. people as simple aam aadmi like you and me as well you know we we think sometimes mm. make a difference what can i do i'm just one mm. and what do i do so for me i just felt well writing is the only skill that i have so let me use that to try and make more people aware because like i said everything begins with awareness when people are aware then they will begin they will begin to advocate for clean air and they will begin to demand for it because we have to demand this is a basic human right i mean it's bad enough that our country does not have clean water we do not have education health etc but you know clean air to breathe is i think just too much because how do you it's an every activity what, what if you can't breathe clean you're setting up your youth for failure you're setting up your elderly for an early and horrible death and us ourselves as well so absolutely I, Yeah, so I think it's uh, to answer your question in short. I think it begins with awareness, but there is no other way but advocacy. To and that is what one of the co-founders in our in Care for Air did when Gopal um, uh, Shankar Narayanan had uh, petitioned the Supreme Court of India on behalf of three mm-hmm. thought uh, through a, a writ petition because he felt that you know to 
you have to actually go out there. If the government is not giving us the policy, then you have to approach as a democracy. There are only, you know, there's the legislature, there's uh, judiciary, and there's the executive. So you have to keep asking, and you have to ask all of them, and, and you know, yeah. executive policy makers, and you have to go back to the politicians and legislature. Otherwise, you have to go to the judiciary. So you have to advocate for it in any way that you can. And he did it in the way that he could. His skill set is, you know, he's a lawyer. So lawyer. All- have something in us and you know the job that i think parisar is doing for example is excellent because you guys are trying to take a particular part of something and do mm-hmm. what you can and that absolutely yes thank you thank you so much for that but yeah as you said i mean air quality is something that you have to go at it with everything you got because there are so many layers to it and there are so many stakeholders it's just quite complicated uh and another very big piece of this whole uh, jigsaw puzzle is the political will i mean in your book you have uh, spoken about how the aam aadmi party has been um, crucial has been significant in actually making air quality a household issue with whatever measures it brought in um odd even scheme or whatever else there was under the uh, gradual um, under the grab so um how how would you really uh, Uh, speak about uh, how you got the aam aadmi party to actually take this issue on board i mean i'm not necessarily you uh, were the only instrument in getting this done but how do you think the political uh, uh, political class can be involved in this issue because that is where all change starts i mean let's be quite frank about it absolutely and and i think people like you and me and all of us uh, who are working in this field whether we are working it as a job or because it's our passion I think all of us need to vote not just with our ballots but with our wallets because don't forget it's not just uh it's it 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 really isn't just the fact that air quality is terrible and that it all the dust is affected by it. but it is also the fact that you know pollution is has a lot of externalities so for example the people mm. be polluting the polluters maybe mm. making money profits from it uh, but the people who are getting affected by it are not necessarily the ones who are polluting so there is an external yeah. second also you know um, there's a in independent documentary made by chai jing which i have mentioned in my book also, uh, which had china to turn around and start cleaning our air it was a big uh, okay. a lot of uh, views millions of uh, views it was made by a journalist whose name was chai jing and something that stayed with me pollution smells of money and True. really too many lobbies so if you start saying that oh, we have to uh, go after automakers because we need you know there's a lot of vehicular pollution they will say well you know there there's a lot of crop stuff so there's a lot of what about it that goes mm. on mm. and you know you need to actually attack every single uh, cause pollution and you need to do it in an organized way in not in an ad hoc sort of way that you know when pollution peaks you start thinking okay what do i do yeah. it's not a bandaid solution you need this to be a mission of national importance just like swachh bharat is you need swachh mm-hmm. bharat in fact i don't even understand how you can have swachh bharat without swachh without because okay. you can't breathe in it. how do you you live in a clean in the how talk about the how to start up in india how do you do anything in india when you can't even breathe in so i really feel strongly about this is that it's not just the government it's the corporates it's the individuals we all need to you know join hands and say this much and no further it's already too late we need to start yesterday not even today today true true and like you said in your uh, Uh, reply right now that you know it's not like the government is not doing anything they are doing things but um, we need to really be careful of what they are passing off as air quality air pollution mitigation i mean most of the things that the government are probably doing are reactive and bandaid solutions as you have said and the very recent ones in those sort of solutions has been the smoke towers which have been erected by delhi and not surprisingly a lot of other cities are also running for them because they think that that massive tower which is uh, you know erected in a public place 
is going to suck out all the pollution from the air, which is obviously not true. So I want you to really uh, tell, I mean, speak about it and let people know how, in fact, going for such solutions may actually be a step back in the fight for cleaner air. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up because this is a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, pollution uh, is actually caused by emissions and only use pollution is to stop emissions at source. There is no other way. Otherwise, it's like filling water in a bucket with a hole in it. You know, uh, and smog tower is essentially, you know, when you set up and so filter indoors work because an indoor uh, room is sealed off. So you have a certain mm -hmm. air in there and a filter will, uh, you know, these HIPAA filters will filter out, like a chhanni will filter out chai patti. Mm -hmm. a, a HIPAA filter filters out the smallest of particles which uh, even our body cannot uh, filter out. So in a closed environment, those may work. But in an open environment, they don't work at all. They're inefficient. They are completely inefficient. Are wasting public money, you know, taxpayers' hard earned money in, in these fake solutions. It's a red herring. And mm -hmm. I feel strongly about it because not only is it not helping reduce pollution, it is, in mm -hmm. my mind, adding to pollution. And let me tell you how. When you mm -hmm. have a large small tower with huge heap filters in there, huge filters, physical filters, filters out, and, uh, PM2.5 they very quickly will get clogged. Now, hmm. what do you do with those clogged filters? Those particles, yeah. Our landfills are already overflowing. So what happens is very often you get are on fire. In fact, now recently, uh, the landfill fire that happened in Ghazipur could be seen from outer space. So when hmm. you are burning these uh, uh, filters, in addition to the other stuff that we burn, you're actually adding to air to pollution. pollution. So what you are doing is, and I, and I in fact also feel bad that we have uh, filters in our homes because you see when you are anything that has filters, I put my little face, my bedroom is clean. Now I'm tossing out this filter. It's not mm -hmm. as if just taking it back. It's going to go back in the landfill. So I have landfill. in my little space, and now that dirty air which is going to be burnt at the Ghazipur or the Bhattava, uh, landfill is going to go into some poor person's uh, lungs. Who lungs. Right. In fact, I call this a solution. A lot of us, we call it protective measures. We have to protect ourselves. We don't want to die mm -hmm. in a horrible way. So we are forced to use it. But this is not the solution. The solution is reducing that source. And the government has to come out. The corporate uh, sector has to uh, you know, join hands and individuals at, at our individual level. We have to start segregating our uh, trash. We have to start reusing, reusing, recycling, not just as a term, but really in our lives, embedded in our lives. So, um, I mean, this is something, in fact, as Care for Air, we had even, um, when the Supreme Court came out with this judgment and said we need to have uh, smoked up, we had even, uh, you know, requested that he show us where, which science says that this works. Yeah. And unfortunately, our petition got dismissed. So I am, my worry is that Delhi will start doing it and other cities will start already. It's and already. I have, uh, have, and they, you know, within two or three months, they turn into dustbins, giant dustbins in the middle of the world. Yeah. Working. Uh, last, uh, two weeks ago, a journalist friend of mine had gone to the uh, uh, Lajpat Nagar a small He said it wasn't even working. He was taking it a little uh, low cost sensor. He said it mm -hmm. was the traders around that thought, oh, you know, uh, up yeah, the clean. so it gives you a false, false sensor. Sense. It's just a gimmick and it really should be called out for that reason. And on top of it, it's a gimmick that is being, uh, uh, you know, uh, done at public expense. And that makes it a, 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 a double kind of problem. True, true. That's so true. Um, another thing recently that has happened that has brought air quality and air pollution into the uh, spotlight, and luckily for us, has been the lockdown. So the lockdown has really been like a boon for air quality, um, air pollution activists and uh, air quality activists. And it has brought in clear skies and the AQI, the air quality index, has actually been under the permissible limits in many places, which it hadn't been for maybe probably decades. 
but after the unlocking happened obviously we went to our old ways and uh, do you do you think that you know the government lost out on a very big opportunity to not only maintain that kind of an air quality index but also just uh, maintain that tempo that you know air quality as an issue had received in lockdown that it is possible to get the air quality index under permissible limits i mean the lockdown made it possible what do you think about this whole thing no, absolutely you have you know you you are absolutely right this is exactly what seems to be happening unfortunately this was the perfect opportunity to reset and sort of move towards more green sustainable growth and uh, unfortunately i think we seem to be missing the bus here as well there are some countries some european countries that have realized this they have started uh, you know pedestrianizing making you know cycle lanes and and trying to sort of use uh, a more thought through policy for this but unfortunately even despite the lockdown which showed us such i mean i thought after seeing those glimpses of blue sky and and clear yeah. air i thought now more and more people again you know what they see and what 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 they you know what the mind doesn't know the eyes cannot see how we could see all this stuff if we see that yeah the dolla that mountain range could be seen you could see you could actually i could smell the difference in the air frankly you know i really smelt it myself and unfortunately uh, this also showed us uh, on the positive side it showed us that despite having played such havoc with our uh, air quality we could reverse it it was still reversible it showed us it yeah. it to us that it's not too late you can still do it but i think only the wise uh, you know they say vinash kale viprit buddhi unfortunately i think that is what that you know we are heading towards our own corruption and hurtling towards it and you know i here i just want to say one more thing gdp itself you know the whole concept of growth that is a construct we ourselves have defined what growth is and we are chasing after that without seeing the negative effects you know there are imputed costs that come there are increased medical um, liabilities um, uh gdp does not take the costs of uh, fall in productivity due to disability disease people have to spend more on doctors so that those things are again a hidden cost they don't come out so you may have very high growth but the population is getting sicker and sicker and that is not showing up in the growth numbers and that important to sh- to bring that up and say no you know no one in their right mind tell me today if somebody give you the option here you can have one crore but you'll also get cancer with it is it okay with you it's not it's okay no. you know okay at all nobody can even enjoy their wealth if they don't have health and you know we are compromising our health by breathing this bad air so i definitely think we are at the point of missing that bus we are very close to missing it we have to choose whether we want green growth or black lungs we there is no other uh, we can still get growth you know this whole hoha about growth and uh, sustainability being at odds with each other that is not true today all uh, renewable energy all um, energy that comes out of the wind and the sun and and you know uh, the water the clean energy as we call it that is cheaper than thermal power uh, energy you know energy that comes out of coal and fossil fuels so again you know we don't if unless we want to become fossils ourselves we need to stop digging more and more into the ground and bringing uh, coal out and burning it and then inhaling that uh, those emissions we really need we still have a chance to do it india has some of the best and brightest minds i'm sure there are ways to frog leap over you know this kind of thermal uh dependence and move straight into more and more renewable energy there are people doing that one of the best things the delhi government did by the way i must say is having an electric vehicle policy notified and i think they are trying to build more infrastructure and my request is a specific request to any policy maker who may be seeing this is that every petrol station or diesel station must have an electric charging point so that infrastructure across the country can immediately for electric vehicles go up and you know that's the only way we'll be able to adopt clean uh, energy faster at least we'll be taking this away from the tail pipes and into chimney stacks and the next step is to actually getting uh, more and more um, renewable energy so that one day i hope we will have that solar powered uh, 
vehicle if you you know it's the public mobility that's how it should go we should not have i'm so happy in the last uh, week i saw two cars which were government of india cars and which were electric and that made me so happy we tweeted about it because it was so good to see the written government of india and it had a green number plate so that's the way we right. yeah and yeah i i mean speaking of electric vehicles i think what is also more interesting is um, i mean i'm foraying into the transport side of it because parisar works on transport but uh, yeah electric vehicles is again one thing but we really also do feel that in order to have a sustainable sort of a, um, you know uh, transportation in any city to reduce pollution i think our cities also need to be more uh, mindful of the kind of um, mobility that we are providing electric cars is one thing of course it's a part of the whole solution probably but i think going more into the depth of it it's about cities having public transport it, it's about cities having cycle tracks it's about cities having safe walking spaces where you might not even feel the need to take out your vehicle every time you go out i think that's i mean i would like to make that point over here because i think it's very important yeah i feel that air pollution is not a problem in a silo you know we need good urban planners we need to be i be able to walk to you know all my daily like if i want groceries if i want to walk my child to the bus stop i want this should all be within a 5 to 10 and some cities are starting to do okay. that but yes. unfortunately in india that's not the case and when i was talking about electric vehicles i didn't mean just electric cars i Ab- meant absolutely bus. buses Every- also and especially our two wheelers you know the mm-hmm. two are actually one of the most highly polluting with their two stroke engines and their polluting cheap fuel that they use and so you have a lot of delivery every time you order something on amazon or flipkart or any other e-commerce site you know there'll be somebody coming to your house to deliver it in a two wheeler now imagine if that entire fleet of two wheelers could be switched to electric vehicles or if it was made law that you know you want to be part of e-commerce invest in electric mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. use those are the kind of you know it's not just the government corporates need to do this today and as an individual what i mean by voting with my wallet is to today if i had an option between let's say and i uh, was told to electric vehicle delivery i should be willing to pay more to get the same mm-hmm. flip card because by getting it in footprint and i think it's very important in footprint is like a car but an air pollution footprint is of immediate importance to us because we breathe what that's also very you know what parisar is doing in in terms of uh, uh public transport that really if you know all the good ideas best practices should be replicated and picked up all over india we need that that's the first step yes absolutely uh which i mean we are talking about you know different sources of pollution i think one of very interesting and surprising uh, fact for us was that when you mentioned in your book that an expert told you that if we were only to be able to control our indoor or household air pollution we might actually be able to bring our air pollution exposure below the permissible limits and that was very surprising because in an urban setting you continue to feel that you know air pollution is all about vehicular emissions or it is about industrial emissions or construction activities but indoor pollution is something which not many people are aware of so much so um, what do you feel is i mean do you concentrate on the biggest emitter or do you go out for all the sources of emissions i mean how do you tackle this issue of you know which source is uh, polluting the most so i think uh, that and this is exactly where i want to just bring back that whole concept of um, you know the difference so there are many contributors to air pollution and right. my view is we need to attack all of them equally mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. otherwise also what happens is let's say you're you're saying okay let me try and fix uh, crop stubble burning i'm not going to focus on anything else then farmers will start saying well what about vehicles you know yeah well, why are you picking on us then you go to vehicles you say okay automakers you guys need to get uh, uh, you know bs6 or or more clean engines they are going to say oh our costs will go up our profits will come down why are you picking on us you know yeah. industry so this what about we goes around which is why i think we need a full uh, we don't need any ad hoc bandaid planning like you said we need mm-hmm. a 
thought through policy we need again like i said we need a national mission we i mean we have we can send a rocket to the moon we can we can convert the entire country uh, uh, change gst we can make the a world class metro state and we can't clean our air please mm. i mean don't buy that so i think the intention needs to be there and we need to have a situation where every single source of pollution is being uh, uh, taken into account and attacked in a way that we're trying best and other countries have done it it's not as if we are mm-hmm. that's never been done china has done it mexico has clean air you know uh, brazil has has done it um, uh, los angeles uh, the us has done it so many uh, uh, london is still trying very hard you know there's a case of that young uh, child who uh, yes whose uh, death certificate has air pollution on it now which is what our politicians have been telling us for a long time nobody's death certificate says air pollution you know trying to uh, misinform in a way whereas we all know how much you know air pollution needs to stop being just an environmental problem it needs to be mm-hmm. as a health problem when you start seeing air pollution as a health problem i think that's when we will make greater progress right right that's true uh and when you speak about you know uh concentrating or focusing on all kinds of emitters and through all the different angles i just want to just shove in a question here about uh uh india does have a national clean air program and there are cities the non attainment cities are uh, supposed to be doing an air action plan drafting it and supposed to be implementing it i mean i know i'm quite um, i i think that not many people know that their city might have an air action plan so yeah. what do you feel about this whole program and the functioning of this air action plans in different cities and um, how do you think other uh, cities in the world i mean how have they managed to bring their air quality uh, under permissible limits is it through such plans i mean you know again it's not about this plan or that plan it is about how important this is for the government so if you are for example in the case of china it's more authoritarian you know that once they decide this is going to be our issue going to go top down all the way now in mm. indian democracy you have to move from the grassroots up as well as top down and intentionally i mean how do you think swachh bharat happened there has been a change in in that area uh, you know you were talking about indoor air pollution i'm sorry i don't think i answered that question the pm bala yojana actually uh, has done a stellar job in in providing clean cooking gas to a lot of people who are burning you know cow dung cakes and and uh, uh, biomass and and creating a lot of women and children will are have have in the rural area suffer from a lot of lung and respiratory diseases because they're sitting in kitchens and cooking on chulas which have a lot of smoke emissions now uh, when you are providing things like the you know clean cooking gas to uh, eight crore people you are obviously making a difference but again you have not made this a health issue so those mm-hmm. people when it comes to buying that second cylinder they may have now easy accessibility and they've got the their first lpg they have arrived in that sense you know they don't have to they are now the better ones in the village mm-hmm. they have mm-hmm. when it comes to buying the second cylinder and the third you remember you, your opportunity cost of doing that is zero because you can go out and get free twigs and uh, cow dung and all of that so you have to uh, you have to encourage people by telling them we're not just giving you this look good in your uh, kitchen it mm-hmm. is health so again that connection to health has not mm-hmm. been excellent uh, pm mm-hmm. which now which has gone across you know to the bpl uh, in the below poverty line uh, line section across the country but making that last connection that last dot is crucial because those mm-hmm. same will then go out and buy that second cylinder and most of us need to you know i think uh, the now the subsidy is is given up but the people who need it should be getting free mm-hmm. so we are able to achieve our targets of clean air so to come back to your the question you asked just now i think it's not which plan plan a plan b plan c different countries have used different plan it's the intention and if the intention mm-hmm. in the air the plan will come we have as a country like i keep saying we have the brightest and best minds we can clean it we can clean our air if we put our minds to it. you know we set up a challenge to the young people saying come up with new technologies come up with new innovations or you know have policy makers we have some of the best scientists here allow them the uh, uh, you know the 
uh, what do you call it, uh, give them the power, empower them to make a good plan, have the execution done in the correct way, you know, have somebody who's accountable. You know, if you tell somebody that this is your job, you have to bring AQI down to below 60 across mm -hmm. the country in two years. Now, mm -hmm. if AKP was that clear, saying this is how much we will bring down in this much time or else this will happen. Mm -hmm accountability for everything and everyone so mm -hmm. I think that if our if our clean air plan did that then i think our journey towards clean air would be faster that's and i think we mm -hmm. need to have more ambitious targets we can't say that oh we will reduce it by a little bit little bit little bit every year we can't mm -hmm. say that no. time on absolutely absolutely and in fact the air action plans i mean most of them don't have deadlines and it's I mean, yeah, the intention is just uh, what seems missing from the whole exercise. Yeah. It's um, a, they're a good start, but they're, I mean, it's, you know, you, you lose the race if you don't run fast in, immediately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you but, have to build up on whatever is there. Absolutely. True, true. So you've been fighting for clean air for so many years now, almost 10 years. Uh, who would you say were, your, were and are your biggest allies in this fight? I mean, there are various uh, roles played by various, you know, sections of the society. Who were your biggest allies? I would say, I mean, actually people like you, I would say media, I would say doctors, lawyers, you know, people who are aware and who are concerned. Mm -hmm. um, the, a growing body of scientists who have started speaking out because, you know, I think in the past what was happening was the research was always there. There was always excellent information, but it was sitting in silos. Now, I think those silos are reaching out to each other, but we are still in a bit of an echo chamber. We need, from silos, we move to echo chambers, but we need to spread this to the people who are affected by it, to the non yes. to, to the people right. who have vote, you know, to the people who will demand change. Because scientists, you know, they do their job and then they sit back. They don't want to be activists. In fact, some of them mm -hmm. just, they, they were like, we have done our work. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. right. It's not enough to do that now. This that you know that time has passed. Even for everybody, uh, whether it's a scientist or a doctor or a lawyer, everybody needs to speak out. And I think it's happening slowly, but it needs to happen. So these have been my allies, and I think all of us working together collaboratively—that's the only way to do. It. So right, right. Now what I you think exactly uh, what you are asking. You know, this is this is. Mm -hmm. the Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that brings me to the last question. And then we'll have some a few questions from the uh, viewers. So there is this sentence in your book that there are no safe standards of pollution, no pollution is safe for your body. And I think that needs to be really reiterated as many times as it takes for people to understand that AQI is a number, but I mean, there are just no safe standards. So I want you to uh, tell our viewers more about uh, what kind of, you know, uh, grave health impacts air pollution has on their bodies, along with the fact that, yes, India has the national ambient air quality standards, but how does it fare when compared to the WHO standards, the World Health Organization standards? And what do you think we should really aim for? I mean, is just being compliant with any uh, national ambient standards good enough for us? So I'll, you know, it's a very simple way of understanding this, mm -hmm. you know, better for you smoking or 10 cigarettes or no cigarettes, zero cigarettes. So uh, the closest that all the research that was done in the early days, especially, and by the way, there are 70,000 scientific papers that link air pollution to human health harm. So, uh, you know, most of these in the beginning uh, showed how they use smokers as the people who were breathing polluted air like that, that was the metaphor that was used now if you have if you smoke 20 cigarettes obviously smoking 10 is better than smoking 20 and smoking 5 is better than smoking 10 but smoking 0 is the best of all right mm -hmm. so right. to have zero pollution in the air now in india unfortunately we have normalized high levels of pollution because we have got so used to it so you know today i'll tell my child okay you know bitter mm -hmm. i you can play today because it's only 120, 130. I mean, in West, in the Western world, in, in France, in London, there's an air emergency alarm that goes off. I mean, if you have, if you're, if, if, now also I want to bring up the fact that 
when you have things like bushfires, wildfires, any kind of fires, or even uh, in in our own country in Diwali, when you have you know such high levels, it may be short lived, but these are high episodic levels of air pollution. That also, you always been breathing clean air now then you have a episode that happens like a wildfire a bushfire or like what we have every year diwali uh, even that that damage stays in our body for the rest of our life it does not go away when the smoke goes away so i think we understand that air pollution does not just affect your respiratory system it affects every organ and especially the lethal particles of pm 2.5 because pm 2.5 is so tiny that it will get into our blood stream through our lungs and then travel to every organ in the human body so it's not just respiratory diseases that you will have you have all sorts of cancers you have you know name it uh, cognitive uh, uh, harm you have dementia alzheimers the depression there are papers that link depression to uh, uh, air pollution air pollution so many different diseases and unfortunately because unlike covid which attacks you from the front you know you know something mm -hmm. covid this is what's happening their lungs are getting fibrosis they are going to die or pneumonia or whatever air pollution attacks you very quietly based mm -hmm. whatever your genetic Uh, system. So let's say if I have a genetic system that makes me, uh, uh, I, I have a predilection towards diabetes. Mm. There's diabetes. Now, if I was living in a in and breathing clean air all my life, I may never get diabetes. But if I live mm -hmm. in a place with really bad polluted air, I will immediately get diabetes at a younger and younger age. is going to attack me based on the weaknesses that my body already has and mm -hmm. that makes it a hidden killer because it doesn't just kill you from new and different disease it kills you mm -hmm. from that you could get mm -hmm. pollution which you would not have got had you been living in a place where there was no air pollution so that is actually it's like guerrilla warfare you need to have that's why we need like a war room set up to yeah. you know fight this uh, hidden killer true true absolutely so yeah jyoti i think that's all the questions that we've we we'll just get to those um what covered in our interview um yeah there's one question about masks i believe mm. yeah i mean just probably people want to know about whether masks really uh, uh, help in uh, reducing the damage caused by air pollution that is one of the things and yeah and though i'm not a huge advocate for masks because they're so yes, uncomfortable yes your book says so yeah so cause completely breathing in a constricted way it can also affect your heart and you know so really i feel it's not fair that we should be forced to wear masks just to breathe clean air but if you do want to protect air pollution damage wearing masks does help it reduces the amount it's like you know it's it's just it's very really simplistic you are not breathing in as much of pm 2.5 or pm 10 as you would have if you were not wearing a mask and this mm -hmm. is a different sort of mask from the covid mask by the way because the covid yeah. mask just keeps out the microbiological uh, the virus particles yeah not yeah. just the p5 particles which is a solid particulate matter mm -hmm. that your body settles into your lungs true uh, there is another question by abir balla who says who asks what were the challenges you encountered in approaching different schools to encourage more students to use buses and uh, uh, vehicle free zones in your book you mentioned that you were able to do it in your school but it wasn't as easy to convince other schools yes so yeah that, i think it would be interesting to know more about that <laughs> yeah so uh, i very important so i feel public transport is a very important part of any uh, civilization in fact a civilization uh, in my view is only civilized when you literally have the ceo and his security guard taking the same uh, public transport to work that to me is real civilization 
now when we are cycling on in a cycling lane and yes in our uh, school so um, i was the uh, uh, president of the pta of my school and and uh, um, my uh, the secretary of the pta and i uh, were both very passionate about trying to get more children on uh, school buses and uh, when the principal and this is all there in the book uh, when the uh, principal suggested that you know let's try and get more kids on uh, i think that school the school had 2800 children the sanskriti school and of those only 650 were taking the school bus at that time so uh, we had about um, 17 buses and we tried to then double the number of buses and double the number of kids and we we got pretty close we had about 1300 and double the number of buses it was tough because you know everybody wants that uh, uh, convenience of having your car if you can afford it your car and driver take you to school but i think a bus has many advantages it doesn't just i remember my school days when you know you interact with older children you become social in a whole different way you make friends from the bus time used to be the most fun time actually going school and coming back you know hanging out with your friends secondly and more importantly behavioral change begins very early so if you start taking mm-hmm. age you will never hesitate from taking it as you get older right as a public transport yeah taken a bus in your whole life then how are you mm. when you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s right so i think for both reasons public transport and taking buses was a very important part and we managed to get through get it done in our school but it was very hard to try and convince other schools and I have to admit i i guess i should have tried harder it was just so exhausting to get it done in our own school <laughs> yeah you've written about that so we didn't even have that kind of encouragement of teachers we knew and and the principal etc and i really wish other schools would take this on in fact i i actually wish that this becomes uh, mandatory i mean why should mm-hmm. Schools must have school buses, you know, and only children who have special needs or some other problem, they can come in their own private transport, carpooling if necessary. But it mm-hmm. should be mandatory to come in uh, to school in a school bus, you know. It it really should be because that is the earliest age at which you start doing this and making these uh, choices for your life. Right. Yeah. Ah, uh, there's another question on um. the role of you know social media and uh, all forms of media print and uh, otherwise that uh, that i mean how do all these sources of uh, media help in the fight for equality how what was your personal experience about it? of course you are part of the media that we are speaking of but yeah what's been your experience about it so uh, i have to say that uh, i'm also a problem i hope i'm part of the solution tends to also go by trps today's media especially you know so you have what i call only journalism which is journalism which is good for you and you should be consuming fast tips trps your say yeah. who is going out with whom what gossip is there in the cricket world cricket bollywood and you know who who is killed whom and all now i think it's very important to consume broadly journalism that also make your environment better uh, place it makes you become more aware but i am more evolved as a human being. so i think it's very important for media to do that and and unfortunately i don't think again it's a matter of money who who owns that media who, i mean as subscribers are paying for it. when you start having subscribers who pay for their news and i think media also will be able to get a certain amount of independence which will help it to take the decisions make the you know do the right stories do more of broccoli, broccoli journalism rather when you have you know media that's just trying to sell things you have you know if you have media by a business house that actually wants to push its products then they are mm-hmm. pressure on the editorial side to actually do certain things which would not be ethical so right. i think it's important for media in any country to be extremely independent and for that institution to be strong and i think unfortunately in our country Uh, that has not been the case media has been pressured as it has been um, you know a lot of business houses in india also make use of media and do not allow journalists to do their job in an ethical way and i think actually is part of the problem but social media has helped to do i mean uh, 
long interview like this would uh, be carried on any conventional uh, any even the best of podcast uh, uh, journalists carrying this interview but social media has managed to uh, democratize it and i think that's where the hope mm-hmm. is they are able to get more information and and care for it works with a lot of uh, young people and we have uh, uh, you know teams that actually do the you know, they work on yeah they work on advocacy and change and they try and make sure that other children who are maybe younger than them or in school we have a team which has uh, where there are college children uh, uh, college students who are actually helping to spread this word and i think it's very they are the ones it's their future that they are fighting for so that's exactly what we need we need that to actually take this fight to the next level true true uh there is another question related to media so we'll have that and then one last question and i think we'll end it for the day uh so uh, the question is related to the media that very often we see the media only covers air pollution issues during the winter months of october to february how can we encourage media to cover it throughout the year something you've also struggled with in i mean you've documented that struggle in your book yeah so what do you feel about that so i think the first step to do that is again uh, we cannot normalize air pollution because uh, when you say that media only covers it in the worst pollution months you are talking of levels of 500 plus when your pm 2.5 goes over 3 or 500 when media starts thinking of this as a story because the rest of the time people don't want to hear first bad news nobody wants to hear bad news right now you have lower levels of of pollution to the rest of the year at that time you're thinking oh the air is clean it's not i mean when you have and there are different pollutants by the way i focus on pm2.5 because you know otherwise the problem becomes so big you you try and make small things of that to try and deal with it but there's ozone um, there is uh, so2 sox now all these things they are at different parts of the year you have different things that uh, sort of take on the bigger role and very important again to spread that awareness because media does have it 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 is responsible for so there should be more stories done in the summer months for example saying okay your pm 2.5 levels may be here on your ozone no. mm-hmm. so it's very important for media to take on that role create stories around these uh, different uh, uh, pollutants and you know for example i think that story that the new york times did was fantastic because they they made a narrative around something that would have been very boring if they had just put it in two paragraphs that you know it's a social yeah. da 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 yeah. and people glaze over the story around it so mm-hmm. to spy something like this the only two ways of of actually reaching out to younger people who are our future and they are affected by this and they can also make a difference one is to gamify it and the other is to storyify it i tried to, mm. to and and make this a personalized narrative because i felt that was one way of pulling people into a story because you mm. know we are human beings we tend to listen to stories we stories absolutely uh, everything is about received wisdom in that way but gamifying it is another way of doing it and these are the only ways because otherwise we will die out even faster as a species than we are already mm. doing I love that. I love those two options, storyify and gamify. Let me tell you that. Uh so yeah, let me just go with the last question and then we'll call it a day. So um one of our viewers wants to know your reaction on the case in UK where you know air pollution has been um notified as a legal cause for that uh, little girl's death and I'm no I know from reading the book that you have actually visited their family and you know more in detail about this whole case. So tell uh, our viewers about that. so i think uh, this is a land judgment because it actually is able to pin down something that people get away by that oh air pollution is no one's death certificate in our own country by our own health minister um i think it's very important that now that this has happened nobody can at least make statements like that which are very irresponsible to be because air pollution like i said it may not kill you it does indirectly uh, Mm-hmm. um when i met rosamond and and i saw her determination to fight kind of you know it was so unfair her daughter not even she didn't have any rest issues 
before and she would and I walked down the road that she used to walk from her home to her to school and it's very of course nothing compared to India nothing Delhi and our urban city still crowded level and when I her our pollution levels she was all she was like how do you live with that and you know her own uh, she was saying you know I this like quality here is so bad affecting our children and I think London is actually doing something. Sadiq uh, Khan himself has uh, yes, so he's really focusing and pushing for, for cleaner air. Now in our country we have air quality which is 30, 50 times we're not able to do enough. It's because we, we again we like a bit so you know and the mm -hmm. other I think a lot of us have uh, in India that I find is we feel that immunity, immunity. Please tell people a little bit about this because you know, the moment you start talking about air pollution, it's like, why are you behaving like this dainty person, you know, who can't take it? Please just, I mean, I would request you to tell people about this. Absolutely, because there's a lot of building your immunity etc. A bit of that exposure to that is good for you because you then, you let's say you've had Water, which is not a hundred, you know, kicks in and you're fine. But when you have a solid particulate matter, high, the immune system can do about it. That causes of stress and inflammation in your body, which actually reduces your immunity. So people who have lived in highly polluted places actually have lower immunity. Because mm -hmm. and that was also affecting, you know, there are enough papers that have shown that people who live and who are affected by COVID in places High pollution. There are higher uh, cases of COVID than cases with clean air. That that data started coming out the minute uh, COVID started. So I think I included in the book because that data was coming out so early. Mm -hmm. that places of, of uh, bad uh, polluted air are people are worse in those areas. So immunity, it's it's the exact opposite. Otherwise, you know, wouldn't our smokers have the best immunity if air pollution? <laughs> Uh, you know, you just need good immunity to get over solid particles. I know. Because we have the best lungs and the best immunity. <laughs> I think it's true. true. True, true, true. Yeah, so I think we are good. Um, so yeah, I think we've overshot, but yeah, people have been listening. So I, I'm, I, I like, I'd like to think that we were not boring. <laughs> But thank you so much, Jyoti, for, you know, coming, uh, agreeing to do this. And I know we've uh, really struggled to get a time between our schedules. But thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for writing this book. And I'm sure we'll continue to collaborate in different ways we can for this fight for cleaner air. There is no uh, happy ending to this uh, issue. So I'm not going to say something nice. But yeah, I, what, anything nice would be the fact that we need to continue doing this and uh, be up in arms for whatever data we can get, whatever stories we can find and humanize it and gamify it, storyify it, whatever it takes to, you know, make uh, uh, this issue. Um, I mean, just get cleaner air. I think that's uh, all that I want to say. If you want to say something just to end the interview, please do. No, thank you so much. <laughs> I want to thank you for your extremely thoughtful questions. I, I really think you have caught this whole issue through many uh, Insta, talk to many different people, but you asked a very one, and I really enjoyed about them and uh, I have a little more hope you maybe because I feel I have I work with young people I feel the enthusiasm passion that they bring to this I feel very hopeful that maybe they will be able to change things that my generation couldn't be able to Spoiling the air for them, and now they are uh, clean it up. So we want to help do it, and that's why you know I think it's very important to have young people join in the fight because it's their fight more than our fight. And then the last thing uh, I would say is that uh, it's just storifying and gamifying. It air pollution needs to be there in our literature, in our music, in our. You know, there was a song that I heard called "Dhua Dhua," and one of yes. the you know we yes. need to. You should not be able to exit your house without hearing air pollution. It should be there on uh, 
uh, on in bus stops it should be there in metro stations it should be there everywhere because people need to know that this is like now you can't step out without hearing covid you need to it needs to be taken at that level that level that we that the government took covid that's the only way to solve the problem otherwise like you said you know there's no hope <laughs> well, there is hope there is hope <laughs> yeah thank you so much jyoti thank you thank you